Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, this whole conference is uh, dedicated to smart cities, um, but they're an important part of any city, uh, and for many cities, a crucial part is the visitor experience. Uh, so this session is looking at how you manage tools and strategies to manage a smart destination. How do you make uh, your city smart for the visitor as well as the resident? And we've got three excellent speakers uh, this afternoon, and there will be opportunity uh, after they've spoken for questions and discussion from the floor. Uh, that's probably all I need to say to introduce everybody. So we'll start off with our first speaker, Nino Lazaria, uh, who is an MA student at Indiana University. Uh, the rest of the biography you can read for yourself, so I won't take up any more time. So Nino. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I would love to talk about Tbilisi and about smart tools that Tbilisi is implementing currently. Tbilisi is the capital of Georgia. It contains 1.2 million people. Tbilisi is a mix of old and new, mix of rural and urban, very dysfunctional and functional. Tbilisi has a rich history and great climate and great architecture and landscape. Uh, and that's why I consider Tbilisi as the city of my dreams. But also I was thinking what lessons Tbilisi can share with other cities so they can become a cities of dreams of their citizens. And so Tbilisi just implemented a new master plan that contains three new dimensions. First is a green and sustainable city that will allow city to become to use and to become more green and to use sustainable technologies. Next is well-connected city that will improve bus system and transportation system overall. And the next one is compact city that would allow to um, help citizens to move in the city and also implement different strategies in it. And the first lesson is blockchain system. Tbilisi is uh, implementing blockchain system in land registry that allows time stamp uh, the process of registering certification. And Tbilisi is in Georgia overall, one of the first countries that implemented blockchain system in their governmental structure. Another thing is smart contracts for real estate contracts. And basically, smart contract is a con uh, s um, computer tool that allows to have a contract digitally and to sign them without third parties. Another tool is ban of plastic bags. Uh, in 2014, there was a survey that says that almost 525 bags annually were used per citizen in Tbilisi. And then they started thinking, well, what should we do? Because, for example, in Finland, only four bags per citizen were used. And they started to ban uh, plastic bags. And as of April 2019, it was fully banned and uh, businesses are not allowed to produce them. Otherwise, they will be fined. And another tool is smart traffic management system. Uh, yeah, that, uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, the new company that will be implementing new traffic uh, management system was announced. And it will help to reduce traffic and traffic jumps in the city and thus also help with uh, pollution problems. So what else the city can do in order to become smarter, in order to develop itself? And one of the options is to become a conscious city. Conscious cities is the cities that also uh, make experience of citizens and visitors better. And one of the ways to make a city conscious is to develop cultural heritage and develop the culture of the city, which Tbilisi is already doing, but also it has to develop uh, doing the same stuff and develop cultural heritage in the future. And another uh, tool is a change of behavior and change of culture of the citizens, which is very hard to do. But the way to do that it, uh, may be, might be um, awareness, sharing awareness with the citizens why changes are necessary, how Tbilisi is changing, and how the citizens itself can be involved in decision making and in changing Tbilisi. 
And so this city is becoming city of my dreams and shares its experience with other cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nino. Um, our second speaker, Joe Fernandez, uh, is uh, based in London, and he's going to talk about a quite an interesting app called Bus Street. Joe. Hello, everybody. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Todo bien? Uh, mi nombre es Juan Fernandez. Voy a hablar español e inglés. Mi firma es Bus Street. ¿Puedes comenzar el video, por favor? ¿Quieres ¿Tienes salida? Ese, ese, mismo. ¿Puedes como? Sí. ¿No? No está a pasar... Perdóname, pero hay un problemita técnico. ¿No es Jordi? Uh, I have no sound. I don't need the. I don't need the sound. You need the sound? No, I don't need oh, the sound. Okay. No sound. No sound. Okay. No sound. Okay. So this was the problem. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There's no sound. Just happy music. I'm just going to dance, and it's all good. So I was saying, my name is Joe. I'm from Bus Streets. What we do, it's basically indoor navigation systems. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's thinking about it. GPS exists for the last 40 years. We think now it's the time, exactly the time for indoor navigation. So I'm going to start with a question. Did, if someone here never in their life lost in an airport, shopping mall, hospitals, raise your hand. You never lost. You never lost. OK. So everybody got lost at least once in their lifetime in these big structures like hospitals, shopping mall, airports. This is one of the, our first clients, Canary Wharf Group. We start, this is the state of Canary Wharf. It's like a small city in London. We start with a augmented reality for the public art exposition they have there, and wayfinding to the stores in one of their five shopping malls uh, inside the shopping mall. So we think, and we are getting some clients for the, proving that, that the next step for us as human beings is indoor navigation system, outdoor combined to indoor. So for the next month, years, we'll, we can come from our job, our house, and go from our house directly to the doctor's appointment doors, directly to our store, to our restaurant, do everything with an app. So this is kind of a next step of the mobility for citizens, for people. So we've been challenged to do for a whole city. We've been contacted by some, some cities from North Co South Korea, cities from Dubai, to create an app or a platform that can aggregate all these mobility issues. That's our next step. We are already in hospitals. 
hospitals in London, hospitals in Madrid, hospitals in Portugal. Next step, it's shopping malls. You're already in some shopping malls, wayfinding. This is a very nice, uh, how can I say, uh, app to use. But it's not our goal, not our final goal. The final goal is to collect all your information, all your steps, all your flows, all your data, and work with it to help the cities uh, increase and enhance their lives inside for the citizens. So we start being an indoor navigation system. We use basically what you know already, that's beacons, BLEs. We use, we use magnetic field. We use Wi-Fi to pinpoint us to locate people inside the venues. Then we use navigations to get you from point A to point B. We are already selling. There's been, it's been crazy. We, have, we never imagined so many places to, to need this kind of hub. But again, it's not one more hub. We, all of us, we have dozens of hubs. This hub can pretty much plug in for an existing website from the shopping mall, an existing website from the hospitals, any place. So we're kind of a plug-in company with a mobility, mobility and a wayfinding system. That's our goal. I will ask now, please, to pass the second film, because this second film, it's for us the reason for our existence. Jordi, can you pass the second film? Cool. So this second film was the main reason for us to start. This is Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, one of the top five hospitals in London. And uh, this is the place every type of test UK government wants to do, they go for this hospital. We trial there, we already signed a contract with these guys. We're going to deploy, we are deploying now the app for Westminster and Middlesex or University Hospitals. Why is it so important for us this app in the hospitals? Because somehow we found out that you can save lives. Why? We found out in UK, UK only, there's a billion pounds every year that UK government loses because people miss the appointments. And this is a huge problem for UK, probably for the rest of the world. Why they miss the appointments? Because they are afraid to go alone for the hospitals. Keep in mind that the patients are basically elder people and people with disease. So they are very vulnerable, they are not so very independent, so they need help to go to the hospitals. So the app can get you the right transportation for the hospitals. And when you arrive in the hospitals, you can go straight direct to your doctor's appointment without the need of anybody else to help you. So you can imagine and think about it like, well, I can find pretty much what I want to go inside a hospital. You can, because everybody here is younger. Nobody here has more than 30 years old here. So that's OK for us. It's just the rest of the guys, the elder people that has, so pro that has mobility problems, they missed appointments, and there's a huge problem for UK government, specifically for the patients. So this is our re reason to, to be. It's a wayfinding for the hospitals. We're getting a lot of traction in the hospitals, and uh, we, we want to help the management of the hospitals, the data coming from the hospitals, and later on, we can do some check-ins, check-outs for the patients. Thank you very much for your help. Again, my name is Joe. I'm from Bus Streets. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and I'll hand over straight away to our, our third speaker, uh, Uska Stas Baseni, uh, who is playing a re leading role in the Tourism 4 partnership in Slovenia. Slovenia, Hi. sorry. Uska. Slovenia, yeah. Hi to everyone. Um, let me change your perception of tourism for a, a second. Um, I'm from Slovenia. Arctur is an almost 30 years old company dealing with HPC, high performance computing. We are um, owning an HPC, a supercomputer, super the largest private owned supercomputer in Central Europe. And for 10 years, the uh, last 10 years, we have been gaining experiences in bringing this complicating technologies from Industry 4.0 to SMEs. What does it mean? Complex, uh, expensive uh, technologies to small and middle-sized enterprises. And about two years ago, we have been brainstorming about how can we use these experiences? Where else can we bring these experiences to a good use? And so this is 
how we came to tourism. Why tourism? Because tourism is a fast-growing sector, one of the fastest-growing sector, and uh, more and more people are traveling. And if you make a small change in this sector, we have influence on the whole society. Um, we have started our, I would say, our um, trip in this new area with the largest public funded project in the history of Slovenia focused on tourism, where we as a private company are cooperating together with all universities from Slovenia dealing with tourism and technology. Why? Because we are combining the world of tourism with the world of technology. Why is this new? This is new because if we look at the market of tourism, we can see that we have big players like Booking.com, TripAdvisor, using these complex and expensive technologies, uh, having almost all the profit and all the data, and then we have the rest, the rest of the world not using these technologies and doing tourism. So 80% of tourism in Europe is made of small and middle-sized enterprises. Okay. What can we change? How can we make an answer to these challenges? Because we know that tourism is growing. We know that in Venice, the experience is like this, or in Barcelona too. So what can we do? This is what we are trying to make, an European answer. Not a Chinese, not an American, but a European answer to this. The first thing that we change, and what I said that I am changing the perspective of tourism also probably for you, is that so far in tourism, the tourist was the king. So everything was around the tourist. So the first thing that we changed is that we put the quality of life of local residents in the center. So the most important thing is the quality of life of the local inhabitants of an area, and then the lo local government and authority around it, and then building tourism and all the stakeholders and activities around it. So everything we do, we do around it. So all the tools, on system level, not another app for booking, but how to understand where is the limit of tourism. Today, I will show you just one of the things, because we are doing many things, we are running many projects on national and on European level, is the tourism impact model. Here I am just showing a short picture of all the activities that we are doing. We are building a platform where we want to bring together data spread all over around to to address many issues. One of the things, first thing is to understand till what point tourism ha can have a positive impact and where is the, the limit. The second one is then managing tourist flows and then make incentives as an impact token, as a crypto token or a voucher, e-voucher as you call it, to incentivate people to move to other destinations, not to center to three main points. And then a digital password is the link with um, with issues how to share the data. All this, for all this, we are also building a living, so-called living lab where we will test all these new technologies with real tourists in a real tourist uh, village. But let me introduce you just one of the tools just to see how we address these issues. Tourism impact model is a tool which is modeling um, and optimizing the understanding or where the limits are. But let me make it like simple, not with these uh, um, definitions. Is for the first thing is, let's, make, let's take a municipality of a tourist destinations. We have one destinations maybe in Alps, and then we have one destinations maybe in Croatian island. They're completely two different worlds. In Alps, there is no problem about the water. In Croatia, every drop of water in summer is an issue, for example. So every destination, can set the limits for their specific. So issues with water, starting on, I would say, um, environmental issues, but for economy and also collaborations, where are the limits for us? And once you set the limits, then we start to measure the data and put it in a system with AI, big data, and all the fancy things that everyone is doing right now. But the most important thing is then making out of this data information that are easy understandable for mayors and for all decision made makers. Because what we want to do is to make a difference that strategic thinking in tourism is not make like this, as we do it, how we just built another hotel or we just built another tourist resort. No, if we do it, what really cha what changes really? 
this is what you want to do. Do it to daily analysis, analysis and to even more, make predictions. So understand next, next weekend if the weather is sunny, if in Italy, for example, and Croatia is holiday, what happens in my destinations? We can expect so many, so a number of tourists. So if there are no many, no more surprises, that a lot of people come to one point, we can predict this. Just to show you how does it work, is a simple registration for, is a questionnaire, which is not simple because we started analyzing, analyzing all possible schemes and indicators that, that are already around. There are more than 30, 340 indicators. We selected about 200, and with these 200 indicators, now we are working and making questions, uh, uh, this, um, define the values from them, and they put in the system. And then an automatic system put out the suggestions and the reports for the decision makers. To make it more, you know, visual, visualization, visualization, visualize it in a simpler way is we have, this is just a simulation of it. We have a, uh, a graph where we can see all the, let's, it, it doesn't matter what kind of categories are, but like the major categories that we want to measure. And then we want to see what, real, what, would, it, what, what would happen on a certain day if 10,000 tourists would come in these destinations. And then with real data, we see what kind of problems shows up. So with this, this is just one of the examples that we are doing. With this system, we can learn what does every thing that we do, what does it change? It's not just a, a mayor comes, has election, says, OK, I will, beat, I will build so many hotels, I will make so many changes. We, in a simple way, we can see no, there, that's not possible. Because with the amount of water that is um, available in these destinations, for example, is not all electricity or whatever element of, that we are measuring. So this is just a short thing that, because we are short of time, as I said, many more things, and we welcome everyone who wants to join us in this journey and join our partnership, which is free, and welcome for everyone who wants to make this tourism sustainable and uh, make a world that in which we really want to live in. Okay? Thank you. Um, thank you to all three of you. Uh, I'd like now to invite questions, comments, and ideally really hard challenges uh, for this intelligent panel to address. So uh, who has a question in the audience? There is a microphone, so please wait for that. Uh, on the front row here. The mic's just coming. Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Luis, I'm from the University of Girona, the Tur Faculty of Tourism. That's why I'm really interested in the last presentation, really nice. Uh, I would love to, to ask you about how you collect uh, the data from uh, the tourism flows. So which kind of uh, uh, software or tools are you using for uh, collecting tracks? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. As we were already uh, discussing uh, before we came to the panel, is the gathering of data is the main challenge. It's not the technology, it's how we are doing it. Um, as I mentioned, we are running many levels, uh, many uh, projects in which the raising of awareness is one of the main things, but not raising of awareness just by municipalities. It's also on governmental level and by all stakeholders because we also have projects which are involving uh, hotel chains which are not willing to share the data with others but what we do is with this kind of simulations we show everyone that if you share a part of your data then you get a lot of value out of it um, what kind of sources we have I skipped the slides where we have the idea where we have a map actually the sources um, we have learned, for example, that many sor data sources are on annual level. What we want to do, we want to make simulations on our basis. Um, it's a long way to go, but we have started it with mapping, with trying to identify the sources, and now making the steps how to come in the shortest time to, to a level where we can measure like on daily basis and then on our basis. But this is, of course, this is an issue. And it depends on what kind of data, environmental or 
other data, then we talk directly to sources and try to understand and see how we bring them together. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, have we another question? Because if not, I have, uh, which actually builds on that last question. Because it, it struck me as we went through those presentations that there are interesting privacy issues around what, we, what we're doing here, particularly struck in Joe's presentation, where if you're tracking me, then you know how quickly I'm moving, you know my interests in art, you know how often I visit the toilet. Uh, so how, as a, as a resident, I'm probably more comfortable sharing my data with my city than as a tourist sharing it with another city. So how, how are you, in all three projects, managing the privacy aspects of your projects? It's a, I would say it's a great question, and it's something that we discussed a lot in my university also while doing this, uh, this research. And yesterday when I visited other talks, it, the, there was a main issue how we should, uh, how we should address this issue. And I, I would say that it's a main, uh, main problem for governments and for private companies as well. And we don't have an answer, I would say, for now. But governments are trying to find an answer for that. And like, for example, um, as we know, California decided to, um, to implement facial recognition ban. And now they cannot track people's. Uh, but also, it means that they have to ask for people's, uh, um, if they are agree, uh, agreeing for that or not. So asking for agreement, that might be one way, which already all countries are doing, kind of, while we are saying, I accept those terms without reading those terms. So yeah, it's a, it's a big issue that we still have to find an answer for. Well, uh, in our particular case, it's kind of delicate. Uh, we sell it to companies, private companies. They are the, the main part interest in the GDPR protecting yeah. politics. So we are also responsible for what we collect. But again, we sell the service, an SEIS, to the companies, and there they are the ultimate responsible for that data that we collect. But somehow, I have to protect that information since the, the moment I grab it and I deliver it to the, the, the company. But there's a lot of, like my colleague said, there's a lot of debates about these issues. There's a lot of stress about this type of issues. Everybody's panic about these issues. But at the end of the day, if you want it or not, we've been followed all over our lives. So you can say, oh, nobody can get my data. That's a lie. Everybody's getting your data. The government's getting your data. We're not going from there. But anyway, everybody's getting your data the same way. In terms of commercial speaking, for us, it's very, very straightforward GDPR protect uh, legal uh, politics. Oska? We do have an answer and uh, because as I said <coughs> before one of our pillars is, is building on that and our answer is um, as I said European way of thinking GDPR and all these thing, things um, we don't want to follow we want to try another way the other way is if I take five minutes of my time and click on and make my profile, my profile is much more precise of all the profiles that Google or anyone will build on following me. So mm -hmm. what we want to follow on the way is that we build an own profile, which is not shared with everyone. It's my, it's a kind of my passport. And I decide when and for how long and what of this profile I share with a hotel, for example. And if I, I can come to the same place once as a businesswoman, once as a family, like a mother with my family, once as with my friends, and it's the same place, I have completely different expectation, expectations of my experience in this place. So for every time I decide what I want to share and what I want to get. And information that is going to the hotel in this, in this case is not about me, Ushka, it's about a lady of this age with these preferences mm -hmm. 
they are communicating through a kind of avatar with me, and when I leave, I cut. It's not unsubscribe or this kind, no, I cut, I leave, so they can't communicate with me. I'll uh, accept, they have convinced me, and then I apply for a club membership or something. So it's not anymore chasing and following, it's no, I want to have a good profile, and I decide with whom I share it. So this is what we are developing right now. Have we uh, any contributions people want to add to that or any or the next question? Have we another question? I'm still not letting you go because I've got another question. Uh, yeah, we have a question here, excellent. Uh, thank you. So um, you said, a uh, question is to Urshka. So you said you're, uh, you have, um, you want to manage the tourist flows uh, with this, uh, what was tourism impact model. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, how do you get information about the flows and what do you do when you want to manage them? Uh, another issue that everyone is dealing how to deal with, like uh, following people, uh, we want to combine different kinds of data, working together with telecoms, because we think that all the telecoms, like, public owned you know, uh, telecoms should share their data, data, not about the users, but because these are the data that they are deleting on daily basis anyway. So to use this trash, let's call it that they don't use anyway, and just get the information of if somebody is coming from which country and where did he start the, the trip, like in two, 24 hours to see what the, the, um, the movements are. So this is one of the things that we are developing to understand what kind of da data to, go to bring together and then how to incentivate people not to go to the free main attractions, but to spread them and say, okay, maybe in two hours if you come, your experience will be like five stars. Now it is like one star because you just won't get the parking slot or something. So shortly. Okay, uh, any questions, any other questions? No, uh, I will ask then, um, Nino, you, you talked about the conscious city, mm -hmm. and one thing that struck me is that the, and was mentioned by several, I think all three of you, that the, the needs of the residents of a city uh, and the expectations of residents of the city are very different from uh, the needs and, and expectations of a visitor mm -hmm. to, to, to a city. Um, just thinking, looking into the, using your crystal ball, looking into the future, how do you think we might manage that, uh, those different expectations of the smart citizen and the smart visitor, so there is less tension between those sets of expectations? Yeah, um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I would say yes, the conscious city might be the answer for that. So the conscious city is basically the city that makes, that helps to make experience of citizens and visitors better through psychological and mental effects, which means that citizens not only like the features of the city, but also like the feeling of being in this city, which might be, as I said in my presentation, which might be, we, we might come to that through culture, through developing culture, through um, um, sharing cultural experience with as citizens and tourists. And tourists mostly are looking for that cultural experience and for that feel, feeling uh, good in this city. And citizens already have this feeling, but they want to improve this feeling. Thus, they want to maintain and stay in the city longer and don't want to move to another city because of that. So uh, in Tbilisi, they try to develop cultural experience and preserve culture in the city, thus um, entertain citizens and tourists as well. Joe, uh, do you want to add to that at all? Uh, that sort of future management of different expectations of people in the same space? How? Um, kind of a futuristic... Um, yeah, looking, looking you use your crystal ball. Well, my crystal ball says that we're probably sooner or later we're all going to die. <laughs> Besides that, 
Um, I think we, will, we have come to a, probably in the, uh, it's funny your question because a couple of days ago I went for a presentation for a company, I don't remember the name, they had a, a flying car and they were selling it. This car, it's like a one person's car, you go inside, you go up for 30 meters, then you go straight ahead with a motor. So they were selling today, you know. I think it's going to take like four or five years, maximum 10. A lot of things are going to change, specifically in terms of mobility and everything that comes along with it. So if you have a city, and there's a lot of cities in the world, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, a lot of cities in so, in so many countries, trying and exp doing experimental things in older cities to transform it to younger ones. So we're not talking about building a new one, talking adapting the old ones, for something new, something more inclusive mm -hmm. for everybody, more easy to use, and more, more straightforward. For the, so my future is everybody's going to be connected, everybody's going to use the same cars, and everybody's going to fly a lot, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I think uh, flying cars have always been just around the, around the corner for their, their, all my life, so hopefully they're just about to arrive. Uska, do you, have you anything you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I think that can you hear me? I think that uh, language and understanding of concept is very important. This is what also we are doing uh, by raising awareness. And for example, what we do by uh, distinguishing tourists and uh, residents is that for us, everyone is a resident. They're permanent residents and temporary residents. Tourists mm -hmm. is also a resident of a city for a certain period of time, consuming water, electricity, uh, using p transport. So the di there are different differences. Uh, some of them match at one point, uh, some of them mix because at what point also the resident is a tourist and so because if we divide it in two groups, this is not always the case. Um, this is one thing. Um, what we want to do with our things is, as I said, uh, we want to build a future, we call it future, which is human, technology, nature, a world we, in which all we want to live in, um, in which we use technolo technologies um, to preserve this quality of life. What is quality of life is another question. For me, something for our kids is something else, but still is a world in which collaboration, as we mm -hmm. said, uh, privacy of the of data and all these things are respected and all these things that we are doing is all this are on system level because nowadays we have all this kind a lot of data digitalization going on uh, a lot of fear that people have with these new things and we believe that we need to change that, like to build this future based on like experiences that we are gaining with technologies and addressing one issues after other to solve them. Okay, thank you very much. Has uh, anyone got another question? No, if not, I will draw this session to a close. So will you join me in thanking these three excellent speakers? Thank you very much.